Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Marla and I am a registered holistic nutritionist and homeopathic practitioner. Today, I want to share with you foods that you should be eating and foods that you should be avoiding if you have IBS and therefore leaky gut. With the condition of IBS, you have an inflamed bowel. So there is typically quite a bit of inflammation and histamine within the colon. And this is what is causing your bouts or flares of either loose stools or constipation or cr abdominal cramping. So there's a few things that we want to be doing when we have IBS. And the thing is, specifically with this condition, above all other conditions, what we're eating is the most important thing. And it's what's going to either trigger another flare or not. Because again, at the end of the day, the food that we're eating is going into our bodies and into our intestines. And that's what's getting inflamed. So the thing that is inflaming our bowels are typically pathogens. There are, whether it's yeast, parasites, fungus, whatever it may be, but there are pathogens in our gut that are releasing a lot of histamine and, and damaging that gut lining. So that's causing a lot of inflammation and causing us to have these IBS flares. And diet just exacerbates the inflammation and makes it worse. So it is the first thing that we need to change if we want to start breaking away from those IBS symptoms and getting to a point where we are flare free. So what do we need to be eating? You want to remove anything that could potentially cause inflammation in the bowels. So I'm going to break it down for you and try to simplify it as much as I can. Keep in mind that if you are at a point where you are currently eating a lot of these different foods that I'll be listing, don't feel like you have to cut everything out cold turkey. You definitely could, but the goal here is to make changes that are um, easy to follow and that can be implemented without causing more stress to you or that's just going to have the opposite reaction than what we want. So pick one or two foods, start slowly working towards cutting different things out. And once you've done a lot of work, you've done some great pathogen cleansing and gut repair, things like that, you can introduce these foods back and you should typically be able to enjoy them here and there and hopefully not have them cause any inflammation or issues. Sorry. So the first thing to keep in mind is food sensitivities. This I cannot list because everybody has different sensitivities to different foods. My recommendation would be to get a food sensitivity test done to see what foods that are in your diet that you're eating that are currently causing you personally some inflammation. If you are eating, you know, blueberries every day, that might be a food sensitivity for you. And that's a really healthy food. So the list that would come up to you would be different for every single person and it's based on what you're eating typically most frequently. So that's the first thing is you might need to cut out those food sensitivities that you have above and beyond the foods that I'm going to be listing here today. So food sensitivities are one thing that we want to start working on eliminating temporarily for usually 8 to 10 to 12 weeks and then reintroducing them. So that's the one side. The next thing is the very common inflammatory foods that are or ingredients that are in everything. And this is going to be gluten, dairy, and sugar. I can promise you what I focus on in my practice is skin issues and IBS and gut issues. And I can promise you these three foods are making you flare. I know a lot of people will say, no, I, I can eat gluten. I don't have problems because I'll eat it and I won't flare till a few days later. Um, or I can have sugar, no problem, but my issue might be seafood. And it's like, well, maybe seafood is a problem for you, but I can promise you that gluten, dairy, and sugar are your number one triggers. But sometimes the reaction is not immediate. So you might be eating, maybe you had a piece of pizza and you had the dairy and the gluten in there, but didn't flare for two days. That doesn't mean that that pizza was not what was causing your flare. It can take up to at least 72 hours for a reaction to occur if you have a sensitivity to a certain food. The thing with gluten, dairy, and sugar is even if they don't come up as a food sensitivity on your IgG or food sensitivity test, they are still 100% the most inflammatory foods, period. It's just the way they break down in the body. It's the effects that they have on our body, whether we like it or not they are inflammatory. So those are the three things I would say, let's start working on cutting out. These are the hardest food groups for most people because most of us, at least in like the American culture, do not know how to eat if there's no gluten, dairy, or sugar involved. 
which is kind of sad and it's something that we just have to relearn but the culture the fast food culture and the processed food and junk food culture has really put us at a point where we are relying on these foods as staples when they should not even be part of the diet let alone a staple. So we just got to rechange the way we're used to cooking and thinking and eating. And it's not to say you can never have these foods again, but they should be greatly limited, you know, once you do bring them back in. But anyway, gluten is the first one. Dairy, it's not that it's the worst thing ever, but the the casein protein, it just does create a lot of colon inflammation and mucus and dampness. And that causes that histamine and, and more inflammation production, which is going to cause more IBS flares. So dairy, usually when you cut that out, you should notice some great improvements just with that alone. It, the most important parts of dairy to cut out are like the cream and the milk. Yogurt is a little bit easier on the stomach because of the probiotics in it, but it still will cause a flare if you are sensitive. So I would say cut out all forms of dairy for a period of time, including and especially cheese. And then for sugar, this is a huge category. So I'll take a minute to dive into this. Sugar feeds yeast, period. If you make a loaf of bread and you're putting yeast into the bread, you need to add sugar or that yeast won't feed and then the bread won't rise. So the whole point is that yeast feeds on sugar, hard stop. If you have yeast in your gut, which we all do, and you are eating sugar, you are feeding it more and more and more. And what does and growing the population. And what does yeast do in our body? They tear up the gut lining and they produce histamine. This is not an opinion, this is facts proven over and over and over again through studies. So we know that yeast quite literally pull apart the junctions in our gut and create that leaky gut, which creates more inflammation and, and at food sensitivities and things, but they also create a lot of dampness, a lot of mucus, and secrete a lot of histamine. They trigger mast cell release of histamine as well. So if you're having a lot of inflammation and histamine production, that means more flare-up. So we need to cut out sugar, and it's not just straight-up cane sugar. It's the corn syrup. It's the um, sugar that is in our foods, in our granola bars. It's honey. It's maple syrup. It's sugary bananas and dates. Unfortunately, the sugar list is huge. What I would recommend is if you're feeling overwhelmed and saying it is impossible for me to cut out all forms of sugar, including natural ones like honey and maple syrup for a period of time, I would say start with the cane sugar first. Start cutting out cane sugar and all those processed foods that contain sugar with it. Once you've gotten to a point where you're more comfortable with not having the cane sugar, then move on to like other added sugars, whether it's honey or maple syrup or agave. Once you've gotten comfortable with removing added sugars for a period of time, then you can also start working on cutting out natural sweeteners like dates and bananas and sweet potato. But really anything that is sugary falls into that category, including things like sweet potato and, and bananas and apples and that kind of stuff. This is the hardest part, but once you've gotten off of sugar for a couple months, you will notice how much better your gut health is. And nothing is temporary or nothing is permanent. It's all temporary. So if you're stressed out, like, how am I going to live like this? It is a tiny blimp in your life, in your entire life, where you need to actually avoid these foods. So it's so worth it because you will finally be out of pain if you can cut the gluten, the dairy, all the forms of sugar out, get on a cleanse to clean your gut out a little bit, kill some pathogens, do the work. I have guides. They're linked down below. My Leaky Gut and Candida Parasite Cleanse ebook bundle. You can get two for the price of one right now. It's on sale and they're amazing. They've been downloaded and used by thousands of people and they've gotten amazing results so they work so well you can click the link in the description box below but anyway just do some kind of gut work then you can slowly bring all these foods back in and again it's a tiny little part of your huge life your hopefully very long beautiful life and the the the, the results are so worth it so gluten dairy sugar those are the three things now natural sweeteners are okay but i'm going to put a huge um alert here Stevia, that's a wonderful natural sweetener to use if it is not the powder. As soon as you have stevia powder, that white powder, it's been processed, I don't, I forget the number, but it goes through like a 30 something step process to get it from a green leaf to a white powder. So you don't want anything processed. So you want to use either the pure green stevia leaf powder, which you can add to smoothies, to baked goods, it's delicious. Or, and you can buy it online or at health food stores, or you can use the liquid tincture, the liquid stevia. But I would steer clear of the powder. 
Another sweetener you absolutely do not want to touch if you have IBS or you will have flare-ups is any kind of monk fruit or erythritrol specifically. So specifically erythritrol, monk fruit that's pure on its own is actually okay. But typically if you're buying like a brand like Lakanto, Lakanto blends the monk fruit with the, the erythritrol. So you're getting a lot of that sugar alcohol. Any sugar alcohols will cause an IBS flare because they bring a surge of fluid to the gut and it's like a, a laxative essentially, but not in a good way. Um, it creates a lot of gut inflammation. So you'll either have a lot of really loose stools or you'll have a lot of abdominal cramping if you have IBS-C. So I would just steer clear of sugar alcohols and stick to a liquid stevia or you can use a little bit of Yacon syrup, Y-A-C-O-N. So that's the sweetener side of things. You can bake a lot of beautiful things with that, beautiful desserts and they're completely sugar-free. You can even find chocolates that are used with stevia, so sugar-free. Once you've gotten a handle on the gluten, dairy, and sugar, yes, there is more that you could cut out to continue working on bringing inflammation down in the gut. The first thing are beans, kidney beans, black beans. Now, these are not unhealthy foods, but they are high lectin foods, which cause a lot of gut irritation when the gut is already irritated and inflamed. If once we get your gut back and it's de-inflamed, it's healthy, it's strong, it's doing well, you can enjoy beans and you'll notice that not only are you not getting bloated from them, but they actually really feel good to eat. So they're foods that you absolutely can enjoy in the future, but for now they can be really inflammatory because they are so high in lectins. The next food is inflammatory oils, which will 100% cause a flare. And that is your canola, your vegetable and seed oils. So these are things that you want to, and margarine and, and, and vegan butters, they're all like, they're full of canola and, and bad processed, expeller pressed, toxic oils. So you wanna get rid of all the hydrogenated and seed oils and canola and all that stuff and pull it out of your diet. So don't cook with it, but try not to consume chips or foods that are cooked with it either. Remove it from your diet and stick to like the olive oil, the coconut oil, the avocado oil, even ghee is great, grass-fed ghee, but just avoid all that inflammatory stuff. The next thing is going to be gums and thickeners. So if you are consuming processed foods, which is typically where these are found, if you are having granola bars, plant-based milks, plant-based cheeses, and a bunch of other types of foods, you're going to find things like carrageenan, xanthan gum, guar gum, other thickening agents, um, and anything that contains cellulose as well, like added cellulose, so gluten-free bread. If you don't have a good brand, you're going to find like they add a lot of cellulose to it. These things will cause a lot of gut and colon irritation as well, and they are definitely something to try to not only remove, but like not only limit, sorry, but remove if you can. Now, guys, I know this is hard. So I actually just released a new podcast and I talked about my health journey in the first episode. If you guys have a listen to it, you will not believe how I used to live, like how toxic I used to eat and how bad. And it explains why I developed IBS and psoriasis and PCOS and all my other health issues. So if anyone gets it, it's me. I want you guys to listen to that podcast if you can, so you can really see like my journey and know that I a million percent understand how difficult it is to go from eating constant junk and processed foods to having to cut it all out and completely change the way you're eating because it was not easy and I had to do it. But when I did it, it completely changed my life. I got rid of all my health issues and feel amazing and it's so worth it. And I want that for you because the... The, that, that ending when you can get there is just amazing how good you can feel. So I don't want to make it seem like, oh, it's so easy to just cut out gluten, just cut out dairy, sugar, bad oils, gums and thickeners. Guys, this is hard. You pretty much get to a point where you are eating whole foods, whole real foods, protein and real veggies and some whole grains and you know very simple things and that's about it. And it's tough, but it's worth it. So the list can go on and on and on. Eggs could be an irritant for some people and they might need to cut it out. There's so many more foods. Um, nuts, a lot of people don't tolerate like almonds or things like that. So that's where your food sensitivity test is gonna come in and really tell you, okay, gluten, dairy, sugar, bad oils, processed foods, yeah, we know that, but also these foods, these foods that came up on your test, you have to avoid those as well. That's where that test can really be handy. But I'm gonna leave the video on this 
another thing, I, I guess I could mention one more thing. A lot of people will tell you that you need to do like a GAPS diet or like a grain free diet in order to improve IBS. And it actually is true. So you ideally want to minimize not just beans, but grains. So like rice and things that are going to cause a lot of irritation to the gut. Um, excuse me. So yeah, rice and, um, I would say pretty much the, like, uh, even, uh, chickpeas, things like that should be avoided. I would say the, the really the only legumes or like grains, they're technically seeds, but legumes or grains that you could have that are actually helpful for some people would be buckwheat and lentils. These are the top two of all of the legumes and grains. Again, it's a seed, um, that are usually the least irritating, but typically even oats would might might need to be cut out for a bit. So that's one of the last foods you would even consider cutting out though. The most important is to start with gluten, dairy, sugar, then move on to the bad oils and the gums and thickeners and then processed and packaged foods. Once you've gotten all those out, you should be feeling so much better already. Now, some foods to eat and enjoy when you have IBS is going to be simple foods, guys. You want to give your gut a break. It's been through a lot. So think of soups, of broths, of smoothies. These are all digested, broken down, pureed. They're soft. They're easy to absorb. They're soothing. Herbal teas. But as far as food goes specifically, proteins are great to have. Um, animal proteins, so chicken, beef, lamb, um, whatever, you know, whatever kind of protein you like. Pair it with some beautiful vegetables, cruciferous veggies or any vegetables you like or enjoy. You can steam them. You can have them. Um, in a soup form, you can roast them. I would say try to not do too much raw veggies because that can be very irritating when your gut is so inflamed and damaged and you don't have a lot of enzymes to break it down at that time. There's these little microvilli, like the little finger-like uh, projections coming out of the gut that will help to digest your food. But when you have IBS, they're kind of blunted. They're, they're not there really anymore and they need to grow back. So until they do, until you strengthen the gut, you want to minimize raw foods, but at the end of the day, really just enjoy your veggies however you like them with your proteins. Have your healthy fat, so your nut and seed butters, and you can enjoy things like avocado and coconut and coconut cream, and then chia and flax, and then you can have um, some carbs like buckwheat, lentils, berries, grapefruit, uh, even green apples, squashes of all kinds are wonderful to have. Um, you also can do things like gelatin and bone broth and collagen to help strengthen the gut lining as well which are beautiful like super foods to add in um but those are some of the main foods to eat and enjoy i know it seems like wow just proteins veggies fats and some carbs like what am i going to do with that but really you can actually make a lot of beautiful recipes and desserts and things like that which i have in my candida guide down below so definitely check it out if you guys have any questions you can leave them in the comments down below and i will try to get back to everyone i hope this video was informational and helpful and uh just gave you a place to start with your diet take it one step at a time because it's not easy it really is not or everyone would be doing it but it is worth it so pick one food group or one category at a time and start picking that off and reduce it slowly rather than cutting it out cold turkey and then as you reduce it, you can get to a point where you can hopefully stop it for a period of time. All right, that's it for me. I'm going to end this video because it was already long enough. I hope you guys have a beautiful day and I will talk to you in my next video. Bye.